First point I'd like to make is that the world that we return to in the future after the pandemic is not going to be like the old world that we left, in a sense, a year ago now. We're all going to be working differently. Staff teams will commonly be working on a hybrid basis, uh, part-time in the office, part-time remotely. Uh, tenants and residents, meanwhile, are going to have different expectations. They know how much we've all been using technology and new systems to deliver our housing management and, um, and other services. Many of them are going to be expecting more of that to continue in practice. For instance, in repairs and maintenance, which elements can be managed remotely? Plus, those residents who are in work will, in many cases, be concerned about whether they've got enough space to work remotely from home, as well as concerned about the sort of facilities that they've got available to them in their local areas, their local communities, while they are working remotely. So how are we going to manage all of that? How are we going to make it happen and ensure that we continue to meet different people's expectations? Meanwhile, towns and cities are changing. Uh, the demand for commercial office space is reducing, as is the demand for in-store retail. What's going to happen to those town and city centres uh, that are being, in a sense, denuded by the disappearance of um, what, what, what used to be there before? And what's the role of housing associations in relation to those communities beyond simply being a landlord for their own properties? Um, first off, um, from a financial perspective, I think this is all about the um, a long COVID, about the long term economic impact of the pandemic um, uh, and how that's going to play out. In thinking particularly about the furlough scheme, we heard a little of that last week, um, uh, how that unwinds is going to be critical um, for arrears and for voids but also for sustainable tenancies. Um, uh, I think a lot of working residents may well have access savings over that time, may actually be in a more precarious position than they were um, at the start of the pandemic. And we know that the impacts of the pandemic have been very unevenly distributed. And so the uh, impacts for, for sustainable communities also really important and how can we support those and then I guess we're waiting for um, austerity mark two. We heard a little bit of an indication last week about when that might be on the cards, but I think that's all um, up for grabs. Um, and the impact on our local authority partners um, and on any potential rent settlement um, very important. The other aspect I'd like to dwell on really is governance, and for me, um, the next twelve months about governance is all around risk and assurance, um, very uncertain times, how boards manage risk, um, how they can mitigate and control it, um, and the assurance that they seek um, that those controls are working gonna be particularly important. And for a board, how, what does good assurance look like and how do you get hold of some, I think is gonna be really important, as will be um, building and maintaining a really robust an effective audit committee, um, which is a key underpin to um, excellent governance in uncertain times. To offer a few quick observations on governance. So the operating environment across all sectors is very uncertain at the moment. And as my colleague Sue Harvey said, I think this will mean a continued focus on risk and assurance over the next year. But for me, it's also about the um, independence and hinterlands of boards and board members having huge value in making sense of organisational purpose against a changing background. So what does this mean in practice? Well, taking control of the agenda, making time and space for generative discussions and not being a slave to the hamster wheel of governance. It shouldn't be that there's no time for strategic discussions because um, the agenda is jam packed but rather that strategy and sense-making are driving the content of the agenda. So that's point number one. Number two, I think we can expect a continued focus on culture. So COVID has brought boards to a place of greater concern and interest around um, their workforce and workforce welfare, but we also have social movements and global events like George Floyd's death raising the bar and expectations of boards in relation to diversity and inclusion. 
And I would expect every board to have had some kind of serious sort of um, reflection and development to um, explore their own understanding of those terms and their application to their organisation. The last thing is that um, COVID has made us cross the threshold in terms of the adoption of technology to enable governance work. And that's not going to go away. We're going to have these kind of hybrid um, menus of meetings in the future, some in person, some online for efficiency. Um, and I think we'll start to think more seriously about what I call open governance, how to um, uh, let the people um, whom organisations serve and the people who work in organisations have some kind of insight into um, the people leading the organisation and their deliberations and decision making and why certain decisions get made. I'm going to speak fairly briefly about the future of organisational culture. So we've all just lived through an extraordinary year of the pandemic. We know that things are now going to be very different. We're not exactly sure how, but some things are becoming clear. It's becoming clear that many people can work at home, that it works reasonably well, but there are limitations. It's become clear that we can make better use of technology, even of artificial intelligence. But if we let it lead us, we will create negative cultures and poor service to customers. I think most importantly, it's become entirely clear that social purpose is everything. We know that after the pandemic, tenants are poorer in many cases. We know that communities have been struggling with years of austerity, that local authority partners are short of money and resources. So the good that we can do has become so much more important. The homes that we can provide, just making sure that people can lead the best lives possible for them. And organizational culture underpins that. So if you're leading an organization, you have to understand the culture as it is, the good and the bad. You have to design the culture you want. You have to maintain it. You have to love it. You have to be prepared to experiment. Sometimes things won't work and then you go back and you try again and you succeed. So culture is about many things, but it is above all about communication. It's about how people treat each other. And I think a good watchword here is kindness or consideration. Kind communication underlies positive culture. And I think it's important to stress here that the example of leaders is everything. You lead by example, uh, negative toxic behaviors by leaders will poison a whole organization. So it is so important to model the behaviors you want. It's important to listen to tenants. It's important to listen to other customers and to frontline staff. That is where the wisdom lies and that is where the opportunity to learn will come from. We have to create workplaces that support and enable the chosen culture. The old office is no longer the thing. They're going to look different. People will use them differently. They will need different kit to get the best out of them and out of their working lives. So I leave you with the thought that kindness, inclusion, diversity and learning are the bedrocks of positive culture. I'm confident that housing associations will rise to that challenge and that the future will be different. I wanted to say a few words about um, consolidation in the sector. Consolidation has been a, a permanent feature now of the sector for um, certainly the last 10 years and probably beyond. And over the pandemic, we've not seen any lack of enthusiasm for organisations who want to consider their options on consolidation. In fact, at Campbell to Kell, we work with many organisations thinking through the pros and cons of this type of activity. But I think my main reflection over the past 12 months is that the motivation for people wanting to consider consolidation um, has shifted. Um, Pre-pandemic, 
I think housing organisations were motivated primarily by the need to drive efficiency, to increase capacity, and with that, develop and boost housing supply. And across all places in the UK, that's a, a very laudable motivation and much needed within the context of housing supply generally. But over the past 12 months, I think the change has been more about organisations thinking harder about their own resilience and working out how consolidation can help them improve resilience um, uh, much better perhaps than they've been able to do before. And I'll just give you a few examples because resilience is not just about financial resilience and capacity. Um, as Sue and Greg have said, the world of work has changed and people are now struggling, I think, to find the right level of resources, the right level of skill, the right level of expertise to enable them to address some of the key agendas that housing associations are facing around climate change, uh, health and safety, tall buildings. And then the other element of resilience, which Sue spoke about, is the impact on tenants and customers. The role of a housing organisation, I think, is beginning to change. And people are beginning to think more clearly and more deeply about how they can improve the resilience of their tenants and their customers going forward. So consolidation is happening. Um, it's still a very vibrant part of our business model and business activity, but the motivation for it is changing, um, in some cases quite dramatically, as organisations think about resilience first.